When Jared asked me to do this talk, we were sat at a bar uh, not far from here. And Jared, as Jared typically does, is very um, prone to excitement. He really wanted to have me speak. And I told him, like, Jared, I'm happy to speak, but I'm not going to talk about R. I use R, but I don't really have anything interesting to talk about. Um, what I really want to talk about is us as a community and what we're doing. Um, and I want to remind Jared that you asked me to do this. Um, <laughs> because what I want to talk about today are things to celebrate, and then I want to talk about um, things to complain about, things that we need to fix. Um, but before I begin, I want to talk a little bit about history, right? And basically why New York has always been and continues to be the best place to be a data scientist, and by far the best place to grow a data science company and a data science team. And it starts back where it always has. New York's actually, for tech, always been a data science community. It's just all the data scientists and whatever they were called at the time were locked behind big institutions like banks, ad companies, media companies. They were always doing this work, but we weren't coming together because there was no real reason for any of us to come together. We were focused on building specific analytical tools and products to, the, to, to figure out some end result for the thing that we needed to do. Um, but then something really tragic happened, right? The economy went upside down in 2008. And as hard as that was for New York City as a community, it actually opened up the doors of all those institutions. Because what ended up happening is you had lots of people who were doing data science work inside of banks, inside of ad tech companies, inside of media companies, seeing the writing on the wall or already having lost their jobs and suddenly being pushed out into the marketplace, being pushed out into places like this where we could actually talk about the work that we were doing. And along with the talent going out into the market, it sort of created this perfect storm of talent and money because the public sector markets were shit. Private sector markets were much more interesting, and so you had investors who suddenly didn't want to put their money into public sector companies thinking like, hey, there might be some smart people around here who are doing some interesting things. Maybe we should think about you know, giving them some of our money so that they can do the interesting work that they do with it. And so now we have this perfect storm right around the end of 2008 into 2009, and that's just kind of when I got to New York and I was like this totally stupid grad student at NYU, like, yeah, I like to do programming, it's pretty fun. And we all came together, right? This is, a, this is an old photo um, of the R meetup. You can actually, you can probably measure, well, there's a, there's a proportional number of weeks since Jared's had a, had a haircut and beers that he had that night. Um, <laughs> but the important point here is that we actually started coming together to talk about the work that we do, which is a thing that we really hadn't done up to this point, and it created a very unique center of data science that exists in New York that does not, quite frankly, exist anywhere else, certainly in, 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 in the country, but I think in the world. We created this diverse tent of what it meant to be a data scientist, and so things started getting built, right? The community started getting built, but then companies started getting built, and the idea of what it meant to be a professional data scientist really started coming together, and it came together because of the conversations <laughs> and the ideas and the work that people were doing right here in New York City, right? And as the future progressed, nothing succeeds like success, right? So we actually had some really successful companies get built right here in New York City that are data companies, because all of the technology companies that exist in New York City our data companies, places like Etsy, right? places like Gilt, places like AppNexus, right? all of these companies that are doing all different kinds of work that are big, successful companies, some of which had big public sector or private sector exits, some of which are just like a company like Oscar, right? that is a huge data science company that is growing and is very successful. The future is looking really, really bright. And so now thinking about the past, I want to celebrate some of the things that we did right. And I think that, again, makes this community one of the most important centers of gravity for data science um, in the world. And the first thing is, I sort of mentioned it already, is we developed the data science profession as this big tent. Right? So to get there, I want to tell a story. Right? When I got to New York City, well, not exactly right when I got there. I had to do some studying at NYU first. But once I started figuring out that there was a there, was a there there in data science, I started talking to people. Right? And I, 
I remember specifically being asked to meet with the CTO of a very large Fortune 50 company here in New York City. And he had just been hired as the new CTO there. He's a Silicon Valley guy, he'd been successful in tech in Silicon Valley, and he was shipping his whole ideas across country because this company thought like, all right, we need the Silicon Valley golden touch to make our technology work right. And so I met him in this beautiful plush office uh, or overlooking Central Park and we're sitting at the table on his desk and I see this copy of Harvard Business Review on his desk and he's talking to me, he's like, data science, it's, it's the future, right? So we, we need to get data scientists. And what I wanted to talk to him about is like, well, we need to, you need to figure out like, what does that mean in your organization? Like, what is the thing that, well, how is data meaningful to you? And I could just, I could just look through his eyes as they glazed over at what I was saying and he was looking back at me like this. <laughs> he looked back at me like, this is you, right? You're gonna, you're gonna be that for me, right? And as you might imagine, the, the conversation sort of proceeded from there. I tried to tell him that we needed, you know, he, I, I wanted to help him hire people that knew how to do the work that he wanted in his organization, but he wanted me to ride a unicorn and like fart flames out of my ass or something. Um, so it didn't work out, right? But that's okay, because we as a community figured it out. And what we figured out is that, you know, my Venn diagram just teaches you about all the things that go into making interesting data science work, but there's a lot of people and a lot of disciplines that go into that, and it goes back to our history, right? Because our history is about diversity, right? There's a, there's a big data engineering stack in data science, right? There's lots of hard engineering problems that have to get done every day. We, you know, I sat here with, for Wes's and Hillary's talk, and they're talking exactly about those things, right? There's also a huge machine learning problem, and you know, we can quibble about the, the, the name there, but really it's like there's engineering for data, and then there's engineering for product. And there's two different sets of people and two different sets of skills, and we appreciate that. As I, as I see the successful companies in New York doing this right, they understand this. And then I think there's the, the part of data science that we're familiar with as it has transitioned from academia. One of the things that New York does better than anybody else is this top level split. We appreciate the need for both natural sciences and social scientists to come together to do this work. Because part of our work is about being good at math and understanding how to model complex systems. And the other part of it is about understanding human decision making, the most complex system there is. And we bring those together very nicely. And the final piece, I think that gets underappreciated, and the thing that we've always been good at because we're the center of all media, is communication. Data science in New York City is always about communication. How do I figure out what the result is? And we've done that really well, and I really want to celebrate that because, again, I think we've done that better than anyone else. The next thing I want to say is the data, the data for good movement is an important one, but we've broadened it in a, really, in a really unique way that reflects really well on us, right? We started it right here in New York. Data for good movement started here and I'm not talking about Jake at Datakind and my involvement in that. I'm just talking about the idea. Jake wrote a blog post. The news media picked it up. We ran some events. They were successful. That's great. Datakind, I love that organization. They do great work. But the reality is, like a data dive is essentially like, you know, nerd sniping fish in a barrel, right? You go, you, you go to a bunch of smart data scientists and you say, hey, we have this ready-made data set. We have this interesting problem that may be meaningful to you socially. You think you want to work on that for like an afternoon or an evening? Is that something you might be interested in? Yes. Everybody said yes. And that's great, and we did a lot of interesting work. And just as before, nothing succeeds like success, so this idea spread like wildfire, right? And, and, and the results have been really astounding. But what I think this community has done better than anyone else is to kind of take a step back from that and say, okay, there's lots of good work to do, but what are the limits? Where should we start having skepticism about the kinds of questions that we're asking? Who are the right people to talk to that aren't face down in a text editor all day building product, but actually maybe thinking about all of these ethical, social challenges that come with data? And again, it comes back to our history. We're a diverse group that's made up of many skeptical academics, in social sector and public organization and municipal organizations, 
that actually deal with these problems on a daily basis, who understand the value of our community, and we get to talk to them. So this photo is just one of many different events that you can go to here in New York City, whether it's at um, Data and Society, which is, is what this photo is from, or from Civic Hall down the street. We have that here, and no one else does. And as you guys sit here, you have to remember how important that is. Because you take for granted the fact that you have the ability to have these conversations, and you have the ability to think about how that affects your work every day where other people do not. But there's a bunch of stuff that we do <laughs> that I really don't like. <laughs> and the emojis get weirder and weirder. <laughs> so I'm at an R conference. I sat here for an hour and I heard a lot of jokes about which language is better than what lang another language. And while I think language wars suck in general, in data science, they hurt us the most. So I want to tell a story here again. Jared mentioned my kids. This is my daughter, she's three. This is a photo my wife took of me um, teaching her how to use a text editor. Um, and if your first thought is, well, what text editor is she using? I've already lost you. Right? <laughs> but the question I want to bring up here is a question that my father-in-law asked me right before my daughter was born. He said, Drew, did you reserve her, her email address on Gmail? You know, she needs to have that when she's born. And I looked at my father-in-law and I was like, do you think that my, that my daughter is going to use email? Do you think she's going to actually use email 10, 15 years from now? I can't even imagine the like, augmented reality meme machine that's going to be pumped into her cerebral cortex by the time she's using this stuff. But I don't think reserving her Gmail account is the thing that she's going to appreciate 10 years from now. And the reason for that is simple. Tools change, right? All Gmail is, is all email is is a communication tool. All Gmail is is a version of that. And all scripting languages and technical languages are tools. All they do is bridge the gap between a problem that you have and a solution, right? This law of instrument, right? A little boy with a hammer sees only nails. And so when we think about which language is better than another language, we are that little boy smashing around inside of our environment, breaking stuff. And what we're breaking is our tent, because our tent is diverse. But when we start projecting the need for certain tools inside our tent, we exclude people. Right? And that's very dangerous. I love this graph. Uh, Red Monk guys have been making this for, um, for several years. And it's just a fun way to think about like, language popularity. It's a toy. It doesn't really tell you anything. But I want to ask you, like, and I get asked this question all the time, young, uh, would-be data scientists, people transitioning from one career to the next, they say, Drew, what language should I learn? What's the one language that I need to, to know? And I usually say, well, if the primary speaking language in your office is English, you should learn English. Like, that's the most important language to learn. Because the reality is, if that smart person who's coming to me asking what tool to use looks at this graph and is trying to say, like, oh, I should pick among like, that top quadrant there of all those languages, ask yourself if you're a hiring manager, if they learned any one of those languages and came to you thinking about getting hired, would you tell them that they're not smart because they knew one instead of the other? Right? If that's the case, you seriously need to reconsider your hiring practices because you're trying to understand how to get smart people into this community. Why are you cutting it among languages? It's just a tool. I think that this idea of language wars and data science introduces an like a meta layer of imposter syndrome. We care about bringing creative, smart people into this community and we're going to push them out because we tell them one language is better than the next, that just creates doubt. Because if they struggle to learn one language as opposed to another, the assumption is they're not going to be good data scientists, which is false. Speaking of your hiring practices, <laughs> they're almost certainly terrible. The reason is, and I've been on a few interviews, this is what you think you need to do to be a data scientist. Write backwards on glass. <laughs> If you Google image search data science interview, you'll see like 12 versions of that photo, right? Because that's what we think you need to do. Come into my office and prove to me that you're as good as I am about thinking about this abstract nonsense at a whiteboard, right? We all 
do these sins, right? The phone interview, which is a live coding exam for how to think about writing this arbitrary function that doesn't have anything to do with the work that we do at this company, but I really want to know if you can pick out this really esoteric timestamp error inside the data. Does that teach you anything about how this person thinks about solving problems? Or take this random take-home test that I thought about for like a day, pulled together data from you know nyc.gov and asked you to do something about it, and then you as the young, or not even young, just a new potential employee at this company works really hard to come up with this interesting answer, and you're really excited to talk about it, then you go to the office and they're like, oh yeah, did you do that? <laughs> I can't believe you wasted all your time on that like it's not that cool. Thanks for doing that. These are, these are things I've seen in the background. People think that it's funny, but it's not. And the last one is the one that I already mentioned, which is the one that burns me up the most. Go to the whiteboard and think about this problem that me and the team have been working on for like six months. We haven't solved it yet. You have ten minutes. <laughs> or even better, it's like, can you derive this distribution that whose mean is not defined at the board? That teaches me a lot about how you're performing this job. This is not brain science, right? This is interviewing. And interviewing is important, so you should take time to make sure that it is connected to the work that you do at your company. Right? Let's take this own simple example. A, let's take the, the uh, analyst developer, or some version of the analyst developer that Hillary was just talking about. So I want to hire that person. What kind of work are they going to do? Well, they have to get data, they have to munch data, they have to analyze data, and they probably have to present data. There's your four interview steps. Figure out how to write it, and then review the person's uh, impact or their quality from that. Don't ask them to do arbitrary work at the whiteboard. The final one is less the thing that we suck at, it's just a thing that we don't do. Which right now, there really isn't a data science career track, right? There's your evidence. A lot of data scientists, not a lot of data science managers. So what does it mean to develop leadership inside the community that sits here? What are the things that we need to do or things that we need to think about to create the next generation of data scientists from all the people sitting in this room? <coughs> well, we have a big tent. Let's figure out the things that we need to do inside this tent. Now, this is more of a question that I want to ask people to think about because I get to speak last. What goes in here? Well, I thought about it a little bit. You know, these things have a, a software engineering career track to them. We already have good examples of that in the world. Let's think about borrowing some of that into here. For R&D, it's like a lab director, I think. What's the career path for a lab director in a research institution? And what are the meaningful pieces of that that we can pull into this career development? Product managers come in many shapes and sizes. What are the, what are the features of that career track that are important for data science and for data science majors. What is, the, what is the framing, what is the thinking that we need to do? Because what is leadership? Well, leadership is mentorship. It's ideas, it's organization, and execution. Because eventually, if we're at all successful, I mean, this title exists in places, but it's one of those where it just got put on top. We didn't really think about it. If we think about it, how do we flow all of the learnings from this big tent into a career we're actually having real impact on a large organization that cares about this career. That's all I have to say, that's all I have to complain about. I would be remiss for standing in a, um, in a VC's office to not talk about the company that I started, just to say that we do interesting work. I complain about this stuff with the team all the time, and if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, feel free to see me after. So. I hope you guys have fun. I sure did, and thank you.